Hi everyone, Deckel here. This is a behind the scenes video explaining how we're going about preserving and demonstrating software for the Intellivision keyboard component. As you probably know, the keyboard component was a peripheral for the Intellivision that was test marketed in 1980 and 81, but never saw widespread release. This was because of its high manufacturing cost and reliability issues, mainly associated with its logic controlled four track tape drive. As part of the test marketing campaign, a total of nine software titles were released for the device. One of these, the basic programming language, was delivered on cartridge. The other eight were on audio cassette. It's these cassette titles, specifically conversational French, that we're focusing on today. Like Jack LaLanne and Spelling Challenge, conversational French was developed for Mattel by APH Technological Consulting. It features a five-part language course centred around a trip to Paris and is delivered by an animated character called Mimi. Mimi is a real person, Mimi Schroeder, who, along with her husband Bill, ran Alouette Language Service, a California-based language school. I'm pleased to say that Mimi, now retired, still lives with Bill on the West Coast. The five lessons that Mimi gave her voice to are split across two tapes, labelled A and B. Tape A is 30 minutes long, but through some cunning interleaving of the lessons, it actually contains an hour of content covering the introduction and first two sessions. Tape B is 45 minutes long and has the final three lessons. Before we get too far into the weeds, I need to acknowledge that this work is a real team effort. Frank Palazzolo and Joe Zabicek did the groundwork. They documented the keyboard component and put together tools to manipulate recordings of the cassettes. More recently, Ron the Cat, Lathe26 and I have joined the team. We've contributed more recordings and worked to convert the full software library. Ron kindly lent me his keyboard component, which he acquired from Sparky back in 2017, to work with over the last year. So with that context, let's get to it. Although keyboard component tapes are physically identical to standard Philips compact cassettes, they differ in a number of small ways. Effectively, the keyboard component tape system is single-sided, as it can play back all four tracks on a standard tape when playing in a single direction. Tape content is recorded with a significant DC bias and the leaders on the cassette are transparent to infrared light, allowing the end of the tape to be detected using a photodiode. To get the most accurate representation of the source material, it's best to capture these tapes using a custom four-track recorder. However, we have found that recordings made from a regular hi-fi tape deck can give reasonable results. So we start with a recording of the cassette audio, which we can see here in Audacity. This one is from tape B of Conversational French and was made on a standard tape deck. So the four tracks are split across two stereo recordings. The top recording is side one, containing the pre-recorded or read-only audio and programs. The bottom recording is side two, that contains the home recorded or read write audio and programs. The first thing that we notice is that the recordings on side two are reversed because the keyboard component is expecting a four track single sided tape deck. We can see this because the starting tone here is at the end of the recording on side two, whereas it's at the start of side one. We can fix this by selecting the entire recording and flipping it round. And you can see now that the recordings match much better. Let's focus on side one. If we zoom in, we can see that both the audio and data are broken up into chunks called records. We'll start by focusing on the data. Let's zoom in again. We 
We can now see that it's made up of two wavelengths of sound, one long and one short. The way that the data is encoded on the tape is really simple. Half of one long wavelength is digital zero, and a full cycle of the short wavelength is digital one. So this little section here has a load of zeros followed by one, 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 zero, one, and then another string of zeros. A while back Frank wrote a script that converts this audio into a text file that we can view and edit. Lathe then enhanced this and it's this version that we use today. This script that creates a file that looks like this. As you can see we have timing information and then long lines of program data. Each of the lines represents a record, typically lasting a few seconds in length. Between these records, the tape's silent, as we've seen. The keyboard component is able to navigate to specific records using the gaps between them as markers. This is similar to the track skip functionality found in some Walkman. Frank and Lay's script does a great job in converting the audio to data. However, sometimes the recording is unclear and garbled, so we still have some work to do. First, we have to remove all the obvious junk, like these sections here, where noise in the recording at the start of the tape is being interpreted as information. Then, we have to verify the data. This is a two-stage process. Again, the scripts to do the verification were originally written by Frank and have subsequently been enhanced by Lathe and myself. The first stage of verification checks the structure of each record to make sure it's valid. Each record starts with a standard header pattern and is then broken down into chunks and then rows. Each row contains 32 bits of data and starts with the pattern 11101 that we saw earlier. This means that once we've seen a valid start to a record, we should see this 11101 pattern every 37 bits of data. And you can see this here, where most of the data itself is zero. Therefore, the first stage verification checks the record signature and the row starting bits and highlights any problems. It also restructures the data so that we can clearly see each record header, each chunk within a record, and each row within a chunk. If we scroll down a bit, you can see that we seem to have a problem. This row seems to have one bit too many in it, and as a consequence, the row headers go out of sync from this point. We now have to work out what's gone wrong and correct it in the original decode of the audio. We have a couple of different ways of working out what's happened. If we have a second independent recording of the same program, we can compare the two. It's unlikely that they will have a problem at the same place, and so we can use the second decode to correct the first. This is largely what we did with conversational French. There are also some standard error patterns that we get to know. For example, we quite often see SS in the data. This means that we have two cycles, both of which have a short bottom to them. We found that in this case, they should usually be replaced with a single digital, digital zero. However, Sometimes it's necessary to go back to the audio waveform itself in Audacity and find the correct spot, which tends to be a pain, and then try to work out what the data should be by eyeballing the waveform. Typically, 
there are tens of these structural issues when converting a single side of a 30 minute recording. Once the structure of the data has been corrected, we move on to the second stage of verification. Each chunk of data consists of 15 rows. 10 of these rows contain 32 decals of program code, one in each column. The other five rows contain uh, error correction codes for each of the 32 decals. Each 10-bit data value has an equivalent 5-bit code. If there's a mismatch between the value of the decal and its error code, it indicates that one or more bits of data, or perhaps the error code, are incorrect. The second stage of verification calculates the error code expected for each decal of data and compares it with the one found on tape. The cool thing is that the error codes are chosen so that if a single bit is wrong in either the data decal or the error code, it's possible to work out which bit is wrong and correct it automatically. If two bits are incorrect, it's possible to identify that something's gone wrong, but not correct it. And if more than two bits are wrong, then essentially all bets are off and the error can't necessarily be spotted. So whilst the error correction scheme is pretty good, it's not guaranteed to sort things out. The second stage verification therefore goes through fixing single bit errors where it can and highlighting larger errors. And we can see that here. Again, we may need to go in and manually correct problems in the original decode of the audio. Once this has been completed, we have what should be a correct program or programs. If the program is written in BASIC, Frank and Lathe have written some additional scripts to help recover the source code. This allows us to understand and tinker with this kind of program if we want. Of course, the next problem is how do we use this data, and specifically the more complex tapes like conversational French that aren't written in BASIC. As I said, the logic controlled tape decks in the keyboard component are notoriously unreliable and will only become more so over time. We also don't have an easy way to construct the slightly non-standard tapes that the keyboard component uses. So creating audio cassettes doesn't look like a good option. At the moment we also don't have a decent emulation of the keyboard component. MAME has an incomplete implementation and JZINTV doesn't have one at all. Finally, Ron the Cat really wanted the results to be usable on his real keyboard component, so we went down a different route. Frank and Joe had partly documented this interface between the keyboard component motherboard here and the tape interface board here. Frank was hoping to create a digital replacement for the entire tape subsystem. However, unfortunately, he didn't get too far with this work. So Ron and I took up his idea and implemented it. We designed and built an interface that sits between the keyboard component motherboard and the tape interface, and we call it the Kitty Faker. Kitty comes from keyboard tape, K-T, Kitty. The Kitty Faker listens to commands from the keyboard component motherboard and mimics the behaviour of the tape interface. The microcontroller at its heart plays back program data and audio from an SD card, feeding it into the keyboard component motherboard. The Kitty Faker can simulate audio and programs on both the pre-recorded and home recorded cassette tracks. However, it can only record data. So whilst it is possible to write, save and reload your own basic programs, it's not possible to record and play back your French practice. Luckily, this feature is only used by Spelling Challenge and Conversational French, and you can't record audio from your own basic programs. Because it's also connected to the tape interface, it's possible for the Kitty Faker to pass on requests from the motherboard and responses from the tape mechanism allowing cassettes to be used as normal if required. 
The Kitty Faker can also take the tape drive directly under its control, allowing it to sniff the program data off a cassette. So the next step is to prepare our program data for the Kitty Faker. Guess what? We use another script. In this case it converts the text representation of each record into a binary file used by the Kitty Faker. This process also standardizes the bit rate of the programs, removing any variation caused by wow and flutter in the recording. For a standard basic tape, this process results in 100 binary files, one for each record. For a more complicated tape like Conversational French, it produces about 400 record files. At this point, we can put the binary files onto the Kitty Faker's SD card and try them out. Of course, they don't always work first time, and this is where we get to the really hard stuff. We don't have any really useful tools for diagnosing problems with the keyboard component when it crashes or goes nuts. All we can do is convert one or two records into a file that's compatible with JZI and TV, disassemble it and try and work out what's wrong. We can't run the file in JZI and TV because it doesn't model the keyboard component and MAME's emulation is not accurate enough yet. None of the development kits we've recently reverse engineered are designed for, to work with the keyboard component either. So we're left with trying to understand and fix the code or fiddling with the timing of records to get things working. So far this has proven to be sufficient although it really cannot be guaranteed. The final piece in the puzzle is the pre-recorded audio from the tape. The first thing to note is that because the timing of the audio is linked to the program data we have to use the audio from the same recording that we generated our baseline program data from otherwise we would have synchronization problems. To be able to play and pause specific bits of audio we need to cut it up into chunks that align with the program data records. Although it would in theory be possible for the keyboard component to start and stop the tape arbitrarily, in practice it only ever seems to play back whole records of audio. However, because we've standardised the bitrate of the program files, we now have to adjust the tempo of the audio so that it matches the new length of each record. When we generated the program data, the script we used also created a file describing the timing of the record, where it started in the recording, how long it was and how much we adjusted the timing by. We then have another script that uses this menu to cut up the audio track of the original recording into sections that match the timing of the standardised program records. We copy the program files and audio into a directory on the SD card. We have one directory per keyboard component tape. And once we've done that, we put the SD card into the Kitty Faker. We can then use a laptop or a phone to connect to the Kitty Faker using Bluetooth and tell it which tape or directory we want to use. And that's it. We're good to go. <laughs> Bonjour, I'm Mimi, your French teacher. Before we begin, I'd like to tell you a little bit about your conversational French course. And so there we are, a summary of the end-to-end -end process that we use for capturing, digitizing and playing keyboard component software. We hope we're going to have some more results to share with you soon. Cheers. Welcome to the Jack LaLanne Mattel Electronics Exercise Program. I'm Jack LaLanne.